Hey friends, how's it going? It is Michael Parker and welcome back to another episode. Today we have a treat. It is one of my lifelong favorite issues to discuss and that is the UFO slash UAP slash ET slash whatever you want to call it theory and ideas. And today's guest is Gary Turner. Geo Turner is his name on his books. He has a brand new book that I just finished reading last night. It's called UFO Science, Secret New Physics, Vehicles, and UAP. And to me, this is a breath of fresh air. It's I read a lot of UFO books in my time, and I found this one to be, dare I say, fun. <laughs> That's that, that that might sound a little bit undramatic, but actually this oh. book was fun. And Gary, your drawings, you are a graphic artist by trade. You are a physics nerd, self proclaimed. So before we get into the subject of UAP UFOs, just tell our audience just a little bit about yourself and why you were impelled to write this book. Okay. So my degree is in graphic design and communication, which I parlayed into doing television production. And that's moved me all across America, all the way out here into the middle of the Pacific, where I've been living for many years. I had initially, I, I do take a more objective, I, I feel a more objective scientific uh, approach to the subject. And originally, I had kind of dismissed the subject because I had read other works on the phenomena uh, where the potential that we as a Earth could be a first appearing civilization in the universe was a possibility. And I couldn't refute the facts that were presented at that time until 2017, when the New York Times article came out and uh, the U.S. Navy released its, its series of videos. And I was like, oh, wait, that opens up a whole new can of worms. And like any good science practitioner, when you're presented new evidence, you re-examine and you open yourself up to those new possibilities and alter your, your view. So yeah, I, I delved back in and I started examining. The more I dug, the more fascinating it became and the more the evidence seemed to become overwhelmingly towards the other end of the spectrum. That 2017 article in the New York Times, December 2017, Leslie Keene and what was the other author's I, name? I want to say Ralph Blumenthal. I think you're correct. As a lifelong buff, I, I feel like the Michael Corleone of, of UFOs because every time I just get like, oh, my God, I can't. I can't. Yeah, it just brings me back in. And that's exactly <laughs> what it did. And it surprised me as I've got to be honest, the last several years have surprised me, especially last year when David Grush came out and made his statements. And that brings me to how I want to start our conversation today. I just want to read something to you, and I want to get your thoughts. In March 6th of this year, Arrow, the De Department of Defense All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office came out with this statement. They had this report, report on historical record of U.S. government involvement with unidentified anomalous phenomena. They had two major headlines here. They said, Arrow found no evidence that any USG investigation, academic sponsored research, or official review panel has confirmed that any sighting of a UAP represented extraterrestrial technology. Number two, Arrow found that no empirical evidence for claims that USG and private companies have been reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. You know the rest, your thoughts. Well, if you don't want to find something, I'm sure you'll have no difficulty in not finding things. <laughs> yeah. And that brings me to my second question. If that were the case, if there were no evidence of us having recovered these extraterrestrial craft or anomalous craft, then why would we create objects or craft that look remarkably like UFOs? You mentioned, I think it's the, I'm trying to remember which, it's six and seven. You described this thing called the flux liner. Mm -hmm. Mark McCandlish, an illustrator, drew depictions of this craft, which anybody who's not even interested in UFOs would look at that and say, well, that looks like a UFO. Talk mm -hmm. about the, uh, the flux liner a little bit. Uh, so the flux liner would be like your Jules Verne version of a flying saucer, where it's like lots of heavy rivets. It's slathered in like lead paint uh, all on the exterior. Very clunky, almost diving bell looking kind of craft. 
So I would liken it to if uh, the Ford company tried to put out their first motor vehicle, it's going to be a bit clunky and rickety because that's what prototypes tend to be. And, and all along that same line of thinking, there's also the Avro car developed by the Canadian company. And that straight up looks like a, a flying saucer. Uh, the only difference is that one has like a little two pilot dome on it. But yeah, the obviously someone is being inspired by something and believing that maybe that's a practical design for something. <laughs> you would think out of all the things that you could create, if we had not recovered craft of some sort, how did you come up with these spherical ideas for these craft? The Avro car, you do cover that in the book. And I wasn't going to spend too much time on that today. But ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't heard of the Avro car, read that chapter of his book because it is a functional, well, semi-functional design that... It's funny, I, I came back from Dubai like about a month ago, and they're talking about they're going to have flying cars in the future. And and growing up, we were always promised flying cars, and that Avro car didn't work out so great. But if we were to create one of these early versions of that, maybe it would look like that. I just can't imagine putting a couple of horizontal jet engines on something and thinking that was going to work out. Hey, if you just throw a lot of force at something, why wouldn't it work? Let's just try it out and see why this doesn't work. And that's basically what happened. They yeah. they tried everything they could to make that puppy work. And after many crashes, <laughs> thankfully, no one lost their life doing it. In your book, you talk about several different craft, and we're going to touch on several of them today. And But you say that only one of them represents true NHI craft, and that is the Bob Lazar sport model. And right. man, we could spend a whole hour just talking about the Bob Lazar story, but I'm going to try to condense this down because I've got so much to cover, but let's just pretend some people out there have never heard of the Bob Lazar thing. What is the sport model in a few minutes? Uh, basically, it is believed to be a uh, archaeological recovery, and it is your classic flying saucer. It's silver, gray, and it, it is that, it's like, I want to say about 45 to 50 feet in diameter, classic flying saucer that is supposedly piloted by the little gray beings. And that has been housed at a secret facility on the outside of Area 51, place designated S4. And Bob Lazar was known as the whistleblower that came forward in 1989, saying that he was hired by Edward Teller and eg and &G to work on back engineering all the science behind it, or at least his portion of the program. You use the word archaeological. And as a longtime UFO buff, one of the things that people that don't know anything about the subject always say is, well, wait a minute, Michael, if they could traverse space and time, space time, they come millions and millions of miles to get here, then why do they crash here? And I know you've heard that many, many times, and you actually touch upon it in the book. So address that. And then I have a brief antidote that I want to throw on at the end about that question. Towards the end of the book, there's a chapter on conjecture where I basically build a narrative that makes logical sense. I don't necessarily subscribe to the narrative, but it's just a infrastructure that you could objectively look at and then pick apart if one element or this element doesn't work or, or you can dispute something, but it, it starts a, a line of inquiry. Uh, in that narrative, it has been proposed that some of the stuff we learn in Hollywood may actually be based on things that they're trying to put out there, elements like a prime directive. So if, like in Star Trek, there's a prime directive around the Earth that protects us and basically creates Earth as a uh, nature preserve for the primitives living here, then they're forbidden from sharing their technology with people that are here. They're not supposed to influence and do those kinds of things. Well, if you're someone that works for an intelligence agency and you need to help influence a society you're not permitted to do, one of the things that you might 
accidentally do is crash some of your technology in their in their little realm. So that was proposed by a, a retired CIA operative, John Ramirez. And then there's the other possibility, which subscribe to a different school of thought where these vehicles aren't crashing on their own. They're not being gifted up to us, but perhaps some of our own military have developed scalar weapons that can actually disable them and cause them to crash. In 2007, when I first started doing internet radio and talking about this kind of subject matter, I interviewed a man, Daryl Sims, the alien hunter who you may be familiar with. And at that time, I had never heard this question posed. I asked this very question. I'm like, well, Daryl, like, how in the world do they get here? His answer to that was he thought it was an intel operation in which they would essentially crash these things intentionally so that we would then recover them and then take them back to a facility like S4 or something. And basically that was your back door into right. observing us. So regardless of what the intention was, I agree with you that I think that ultimately, yeah, they're gifted, crashed, borrowed, whatever and it is, that's how they get here. There have been accounts where they literally like landed a vehicle and then the crew left the vehicle completely abandoned and operational. And some of these people within the global recovery program just scooped it up. And if we use the word archaeologically or archaeology, archaeological, that makes me think of in ancient history or far history. So mm -hmm. that would make you think, well, wait a minute, they've been doing this not just in the 20th century or the 21st century. They've been doing this for centuries. Yeah, it was Bob Lazar that believes in his opinion that from what he understood was the sport model had been dug up from somewhere on Earth. The other interesting thing I just learned recently, though, is this actually helps me put new additional pieces to the Bob Lazar story was I saw the new project going on where they're rebuilding Area S4 in virtual, the Gravatar project, I think it's called, uh, that hasn't been released just yet. But they, they stated in there that there was actually two sport models. So one sport model was fully functional and the other sport model was considered to be parts. You could sacrifice the parts because Bob, in his accounts, they actually removed some of the gravity emitters, amplifiers, and the reactor from one of the vehicles, and they had it in a laboratory. But then he also talks about how there's test pilots that flew the, the sport model. So I was like, in my mind, that I was wondering, how did they do that? How right. did they move all these components and experiment with it in the lab? if they're also flying the thing. And it turns out now I understand there were actually two of these models in the facility. And one, they basically blowtorched out the parts and reassembled them in a lab. Anyway. I'm surprised that actually even worked. And I'm surprised that they were actually able to pilot the thing, given how little we seem to know about it. And Bob, you talk about this in the book, that even he, he was there and he worked on this thing and he had access to the inside of it. He didn't really understand how all of this worked. He had a general idea and he brought up the, the element 115, which we now call Muscovium, but nobody knew about that for sure until 2003. And you mentioned that there is a scientist, I'm trying to find the man's name, who has Ricardo since- Ricardo Pistorti. Yes, explain how he has verified some of this information. So one of the things that actually really inspired me to start reading this book was an interview with Ricardo Stiorti, where I found it, it lended a huge amount of credence to Bob's story because he presented facts and details in his theory that he did not understand. So if you're throwing out numbers and basic data points and you don't understand why it is the way it is, and then someone else comes along, examines that data point, works out all the mathematics, and lo and behold, it's it's like winning the lottery. You just happen to present the exact correct information that you didn't understand to begin with. You can't make that kind of stuff up. 
So yeah, the the frequency that Bob presents, and and I should have that memorized by now, but I I have to look it up for seven sixty two or something. Yeah, seven point six two hertz, megahertz, or yeah. Um, that's the uh, frequency at which the gravity A wave has to be projected towards the Earth in order to cancel out the the natural forming gravity of Earth. So when they when they um, destructively interfere with each other, you get zero gravity. And the the frequency that he threw out was unusual in the fact that a normally a theoretical physicist would throw out a different number. And, and Bob didn't understand any of the numbers in that respect. He just knew that was the frequency it was sent at. Ricardo Diordi is an engineer, a physics engineer by trade. And as an engineer, they understand about using power efficiency in order to achieve optimal results. So, if you were actually to use the ideal frequency in order to cancel out the maximum amount of gravity, you would have to use an order of magnitude of like 30 times the power level required to do that, when actually the number that Bob presented was a more effective, efficient energy usage. So that's, that's again, Part of the issue with all the siloing of the science is these scientists are not permitted to talk to each other and share their information. So an engineer would enter into that program and he would be able to answer all those equations that Bob could. That chapter in the book is, is a great preface into the rest of it because the rest of what we're talking about with the exception of the orbs and things like that and, and the Tic Tac, which I'm going to get to later, are all mm -hmm. our more elementary attempts to do what the sport model did. And one of the things that you say about it, which I like, you talk about the elegance of the sports mm -hmm. model, the elegance of their design versus the ham-fisted approach that we have. The brute force methods that we employ. I, I do want to say right off the top, the whole point of my book and putting it out is I want to dispel so much of the stigma and the understanding that interstellar travel is impossible because it's clearly not. After speaking to many different physicists and understanding the concepts, it's it's quite clear that we've been kind of sold a bill of goods. Yeah. As much as I enjoy the, the series three body problem. You read my mind, brother. It would not take a civilization 400 years to get here from a neighboring star. There are ways of, of moving through the universe by manipulating the fabric of space-time itself. And to say that the speed of light is, is the flat law and there's no way around it is closed-minded thinking. There, there are regions of our universe that have already exceeded the speed of light because the space-time in the expansion of the universe is constantly moving and actually accelerating. There are regions of the universe we can no longer see, and that's what would be considered outside the observable universe. Space-time itself can move faster than the speed of light. I was actually going to ask you about a uh, three-body problem because my wife and I have been watching it. And in some ways, it's good for the normies to kind of get acquainted with certain ideas. But on the other hand, right. I, I agree with you. It, it, one of the things they brought up in the show is the Fermi paradox, which I've always thought was an oversimplistic way of looking at things. What if they just didn't want to talk to us? Or if they did talk to us, we didn't tell anybody. That was just my thought about that. Do you have any thoughts on that? I'll disagree with Neil deGrasse Tyson. I think there's tons of fascinating things about Earth. And Agreed. It, uh, we study ants every day, and we're fascinated by what they do. There's people that dedicate their whole lives to studying ants, and where you and I would see them as simple little insects. So there's plenty of reason to study Earth. Let's say you came from the society that had Element 115 native to your environment. If you were there, Isaac Newton, and you came across Element 115 first before the combustion engine, you might never mess with fossil fuels. And then you show up to a place like us and like, look at what these primates are doing, you know, firing thrust out the back and using uh, aerofoils to move through the atmosphere. I agree with you. That was another thing that's always been a thorn in my side was this overly simplistic 
idea that there's nothing special about Earth. Are you kidding me? We have a very complex biosphere. We have the various flora and fauna. Okay. How, how are we not interesting? You cannot, you can just go ahead and dismiss the technology. Look at our society, the way people interact with each other and how we interact with our world and, and environment. So there's plenty of reason to study the earth. Yes. But what I what I was trying to get back is, so I wanted to dispel that whole impossibility. And even though this is a science book, you know, about physics, which can be rather intimidating, I instead opted to make a book that is relatively easily to digest, hence why all the illustrations and things like that. You know, this is my version of doing a cosmos, but on the subject of UAP. So the, I, I do have plenty of details in the books for those people that want to dive deep, but I also try and make it as lay friendly as I can. I think you do a good job, and I, I am not going to try to explain the physics that you do a great job of explaining because I, I, I can't. But I would encourage people to buy the book. I read the book in a single day. I couldn't put it down. And it's like 150 pages long. It's got all of your great illustrations that help depict the ideas that you are expressing. And you touch on all of these interesting people. You talk about Salvatore Pei or Pi. You talk about Jack Sarfati. It's funny. Around 2020, I was working, I was producing another show. And we did a deep dive on the whole Tic Tac uh gimbal mm -hmm. thing and during that time we invited jack down to la and he spent several hours with us in the studio and jack i like jack but he's not yeah. the easiest guy to get along with and you talk about some of his work in the book explain for the people who may not know about jack yet explain the essential aspects of his ideas so we are all familiar with E equals MC squared. Yeah. And that's the mathematical formula for converting mass into energy. And that ended up creating, you know, that's how we know how much power comes out of a fusion reaction. So there's another equation that Einstein is famous for, and that's the equation that determines the curvature of space-time. Now, space-time is your empty space. And it's, of course, the fabric of reality. So the interesting part is in both of those equations, the speed of light is the governing denominator that determines how much of a reaction you get in your equation. So with Jack, he realized that if you could alter the speed of light, then the amount of power it takes to warp the fabric of space-time is, is lowered. So the more you slow the speed of light, the less power you need to, to create your own gravity. So, and, and we see that happening in our everyday lives with like when, when you drop a pencil into water, you see that separation of the image. That's called refraction. And what's happening is as light hits that water, it slows down and that's causing the image to separate. And it's even more profound when you use like a, a nice thick glass block. You'll see that image really deviate within a, a glass block. And what's happening is the speed of light in that glass block is being slowed by a third. So it's like 300,000 kilometers a second naturally, natively in a vacuum. But through glass, it's only 200,000. And I believe Jack was the first one to talk about this idea of metamaterials. Or, or did anyone ever bring that up besides him? Was he the first person to describe that idea? Um, I'm not exactly sure who coined metamaterials. I know it, our own labs began fashioning and creating the, the, the coin was termed around 2000, like 1999, 2000, something like that. And now we've developed uh, McDonnell Douglas and some of our other industry places. They've begun to develop their own metamaterials. But yeah, essentially a metamaterial for your listeners is a type of material. Oh, gets complicated. It's it basically, is. it's a layering of materials in a lattice that will alter frequencies that pass through them. And this engineering is at the atomic level of the, the creation. It can be. For instance, like graphene might be considered a metamaterial, but that's on a molecular level. Graphene can actually be made 
using scotch tape and, and graphite. That's how it was originally discovered. But the fascinating part that our industries have been unable to create is that sport model level of metamaterial that is, they believe, assembled on an atomic level, likely in zero gravity. When we spoke to Jack in 2020, he, he talked about all these ideas, and he's a very interesting character. He's lively and kind of cantankerous. And yeah. much of what he said, you know, honestly was going over my head. But we also, during that deep dive, were trying to get a hold of Salvador Pi mm -hmm. because we wanted to talk to him about those patents that he had. And at the time, I, I was trying to find him so we could get him on the show, but he was not doing interviews and we could never find where he was. But we acquired, well, we actually hired a patent attorney who was a physicist to look into the patents. And at right. the time, that patent attorney was of the opinion that he thought that the ultimate, and I'm not saying this is what it was about, but his opinion at the time in 2020 was that this was some type of disinformation possibly geared at being disinformation for the Chinese or something that we perhaps don't have this thing, but we're creating these patents to make them think that we have this thing. Now, I've noticed last night as I'm reading your book, I'm also going through YouTube really quickly trying to find anything about Salvador Pai, and now he's actually doing interviews. And I guess in November, he did an interview with Ashton Forbes, who's been doing all the research on the MH370 disappearance. Okay. And anyway, he's an interesting person. Just tell people a little bit about Salvatore for a second, and then we'll move on. And some of those patents, what he was getting at. Salvatore is a, a fascinating man that has developed some of the most cutting edge technologies for the U.S. Navy. Um, many people don't realize this, but we actually have hypersonic torpedoes now for our subs. And basically, if you think about it for a moment, hypersonic means that you have torpedoes that are moving faster than the speed of sound while underwater. Think about how difficult it was for them to achieve that in air. And Salvatore uh, patented some phenomenal types of these uh, weapons for the U.S. Navy where they basically atomize the water around the torpedo, creating an air pocket, which then allows that torpedo to move faster than the speed of sound underwater, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles per hour. And we don't know how fast they go, but like underwater, that's phenomenal. So yeah, he developed that. He develops other things, many of which are classified things, but on his own, he realized that he could do this with his own kind of spacecraft, which he called the inertial mass reduction vehicle, I believe. Which to and, me at the time kind of looked a little bit reminiscent of a TR-3B, which you also discuss in the book. And mm -hmm. this was interesting to me because I remember back in the, was it the late 90s or early 2000s, there was this person, Ed Fouché, who came along and he was mm -hmm. talking about the TR-3B. In your book, you kind of come to the conclusion that you don't think there's a great deal of evidence for the validity of the TR-3B. I'll correct you there. Okay, please. I do believe there is a TR-3B. Oh, okay. What I had difficulty with was in researching the theories that were presented on its driving engine. So the theories presented, I think, are probably not accurate. Mm -hmm. But I presented them to the public, and I also, you know, I explained how these theories, and that's that's really my thing for each chapter. So I tried to devote each chapter to a different vehicle and explain how the physics behind that vehicle operate. The, the interesting part with the TR-3B is when I presented the, the physics behind that, I noticed some elements within that physics that just didn't seem to add up to me at the time. Mm -hmm. And it all has to do with temperature and plasma. Right. Since I published the book, I have spoken to other science figures and they're, they're kind of helping me to 
be a little more open-minded to the possibility in that when you look, so for your viewers, you have four types of matter. You have solids, liquids, gases, and plasma. And basically the colder things are, the more it moves down on that chart where you get, you know, solids. And then you heat it, heat it, heat it, and you go all the way up to a plasma. And the difference is, is how much movement you get out of those molecules or, or nuclear elements. So a plasma is essentially atomic material that's no longer formed into atoms. You have your nuclei and your electrons, and they're just going nuts, flying every which way. That's your plasma. And, but if you cool that down, as you cool it down, then all those electrons suddenly pair up with their nuclei and they cool down and they become slower and slower and slower. However, we know with superconductive materials, there's a, there's a change in the state of matter at sub-zero temperatures where the interactions begin to alter how they present to the world their functions, changes. So. A superconductor is able to achieve its, its ability to maintain voltage, from what I understand, by electrons passing between nuclei in what are called Cooper pairs. So, and, and then, yeah, we're getting into the weeds with, with the quantum physics here, but essentially, if you look at it that way, then, yeah, I guess separately moving electrons might be considered a plasma if they're not if they're moving independent of their nuclei. So I'm open to the possibility. Okay. Well, I, I'm sorry, I misunderstood that because my, my follow-up to that was going to be in 1989 in Belgium, they took mm -hmm. pictures of this thing. So wherever this came from, I've always felt that the, the triangles were probably man-made, but I don't know. And the TR3B, I just remembered there for a moment, like I say, Ed, this Ed Fouché character came along and, and he's, he was doing a lot of radio shows at the time. And so I was reading into it and I have a friend who witnessed two of them in 1995 in the Middle East. Do you know about this? No. This, uh, well, anyway, it was, it was in the United Arab Emirates and two of them in the middle of the day in 1995, I, I have a newspaper article that I will send afterwards. So these things exist. Where they came from, I don't know. But you also mentioned um, Gary McKinnon's work or when he was in the early 2000s. He was doing this hacking into databases yeah. and seemed to come on to the space force. And in my mind, I always imagined that they were triangular craft. But have you heard anything more about that since that happened in the early 2000s? I have not. And essentially, yeah, he he was an interesting man that at the time he was a kid. Yeah. He basically searched through the Internet. He created a, um, a spider uh, that would basically crawl the Internet and looking for government computers that had like either no password protection at all or simple password protection like one two three four and eventually he stumbled across a nasa computer that had a spreadsheet that listed a series of um, non-earth fleet vessels and i believe it even included like names of crew members or captains and so on but yeah some of the tr3b uh uh Testimonies have been stating that these vehicles can range in size from anywhere from a fighter size vehicle to even like aircraft carrier size TR-3Bs. The one photo I would like to point out in the book on the TR-3B is because of the toy, I'm hard to pronounce word, toyroid shape of the central engine, which is basically a donut shape. It creates this plasma arcing effect. And some of the photographs that are seen in Belgium actually show, and I highlight that in the book in one of the photographs, these plasma offshoots coming off of the toroid display, which would naturally happen with an engine type like this. For the people who are listening to this on the podcast, 
you're going to have to go buy the book. But for those who are watching the video, I am going to include some of these photos and pieces of art, your illustrations during the course of the video in post-productions. And that's one of the pictures that I'm going to put in there because I had never heard anyone explain that. Or if I did, I had forgotten it and you re-reminded me of that. But the TR3B or the flying triangles, the Astra, whatever we choose to call it, it does seem like they are a real thing, and it makes you wonder if we have these types of technologies, you have to think, okay, wait a minute, SpaceX and Blue Origin and all of these new companies are still operating on old school technology when we probably have this other thing so who's in control of these things if they do in fact exist and where are they keeping them? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I do say that uh, I present these different vehicles and I'm not picking winners and losers. I'm True. just presenting the theories and trying to make them as understandable as possible. And yeah, my understanding of what is likely is still ever evolving. As more data comes in, I go where the data takes me. Yeah, that's one thing you've stated in several interviews and in the book, and I like that because you have mentioned that people typically choose to criticize the person rather than the data. We take Bob Lazar, for example. People immediately want to attack Bob, and they think if they attack Bob, then they can relegate the entire story to somehow the rubbish bin or whatever, and I like the fact that you don't do that. I actually, I'm trying to coin a new term. I'm calling it a sweeping dismissal. I like that. So in a sweeping dismissal, what a debunker will do is they will find one or two pieces of evidence out of, say, 10 or 15 pieces in a particular project, and they will find a way to refute those one or two details. And then, see, look, this whole thing right here, because of these one or two elements, the whole thing is just bunk and you can just dismiss all the other pieces of evidence. And we as a people that are open and trying to explore the subject, we've got to stop doing that. Just because someone finds one thing to refute doesn't mean you should ignore all the rest of the evidence. Like, for instance, when the drones that were flying around the, the Navy vessels that appeared as pyramid objects in night scope vision. The, they tried to debunk it by basically saying it was bokeh, which is like the, the right. shape of the lens aperture. Yes. They were bokeh artifacts within the video. Well, you're in order to just completely dismiss everything there, you also have to dismiss all of the other technological radar, all the other imaging uh, and witnesses on board. You can't just take one thing and say, let's throw all the rest of it out with the bathwater. Agreed. The, the whole Nimitz story, the, the 2004 November Nimitz thing, we interviewed several of the people involved with that back on this other show, and they were seeing those objects in the days leading up to the 14th. For, for the, the 10th through the 13th, they were seeing them on radar before Fravor actually engaged with the Tic Tac. And right. I, I want to talk a little bit about the Tic Tacs and, and the orbs slash spheres, because this is where it gets really interesting to me, because you lay out Bob Lazar, NHI craft, then we talk about the ones that are man-made, and then towards the end of the book, now you're bringing up this other aspect of these things. So the Tic Tac and orbs some people that were involved in the Nimitz situation, this was the first time I had heard this, and I don't remember which person said this, so I don't want to allege as to who it was, but basically they put forth the idea that in their mind, they thought that perhaps that the Tic Tac was something that maybe was old technology that has existed for thousands of millennia of year, and it still functions and floats around you know, the planet doing whatever it does, it's perhaps some form of AI. And then when we talk about the orbs, I've heard other people say similar things about that they think that the uh, orbs are maybe some form of ultra terrestrial that have always been here. Talk about the orbs a little bit. I, I do have to laugh uh, when like um, the Department of Defense comes out and says, oh, the Mosul orb was a drone. Right. Like, 
like saying it's a drone is just a way to say, oh, well, you can dismiss that. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen any basketball shaped drones flying through the air on their own, own autonomous ability. Yeah, it may very well be a drone. It's just probably not a human drone. But there's lots of different aspects to the phenomena that you can't help but inevitably dip a toe into the woo, as it's getting to be known as, yep. uh, especially when you get into like plasma orbs. That's just a phenomenon. And the science behind that is like, wow, that's, that's a whole different, you could dedicate a life to just studying that kind of thing. The metallic orbs present some fascinating cases, like the Bet Sphere that came out in the 1970s. Talk about and, that, because I wanted to ask you about that, and I'm not sure if I remembered this case. Please, this is fascinating to me. Talk about this case. So yeah, back in the 1970s, when Project Blue Book was still well underway, this uh, guy down in Florida, I believe, uh, found this sphere out on a hike. And it was, you know, a size of a basketball, basically. And it was this metallic sphere that had no seams on it, no drill holes, nothing like that. It did have a little triangular etching on one side, I understand. And he brought it back to his home. He thought it was fascinating because autonomously, this sphere began to roll around in his house almost like a pet. It would follow him around and turn and roll backwards. And people came and saw this was happening. And of course, everyone was like, well, the floorboards must be uneven or whatever. No, there's actually video where they show it rolling on a rug. And it's on the internet. You can look that one up where it's rolling around on the rug and it's following a person as they walk around on this rug. Well, Project Blue Book and the Department of Defense came down and they began to study this ball. They, they took it back with them, and the Betts, I, I forget his first name, but he went with the ball during the study because he didn't really want to leave it out of his sight. And J. Allen Hynek and the rest of Project Blue Book were studying it when uh, he got this emergency phone call that his mother had been in a car accident back in Florida. And so when he couldn't reach her by phone or other family members, he hopped on a plane and flew back to Florida, rushed to the hospital, and then he finds out there was no accident. His mother was perfectly fine. Well, by the time he got back to recover the sphere, it had um, departed. J. Allen Hynett had taken it with him back to his home, and then he had to get into this legal wrangling in order to get the ball back for himself. By the time he was able to receive it, the ball no longer had the ability to roll around anymore. And when x-rayed, some of the things that uh, were revealed during the study had suddenly vanished and it was just a regular plain ball now. Yeah, so it clearly was not the same item. Yeah, they switched it out. And even J. Allen Hynek's son said that he was aware that his father had kept and held on to one of these spheres uh, and he'd seen it later in his life. His son is on Twitter, X, and I think I, I might reach out to him. You also mentioned that there is some, this comes from uh, Russ Coolhart. Yes. He relays a story that someone had tipped him off. I believe it was Willie Nelson's manager of yeah, all band things. Manager. Okay, now explain this to me because I didn't quite get this part. So the manager has a friend who is a musician of note. We don't know who yes. it is. Now he Living has- out in the middle of the boonies. And he so has he, some of these balls. That, that he came across some of these balls and evidently at least one of them exhibited the exact same behavior as the bet sphere. Oh, so he didn't collect some of these. Oh, he did. So, so he, I don't, I only know of at least one. He may have more than one. I don't know. But Ross Coulthard came and interviewed him. And during the interview, the ball began to do exactly what the Bet Sphere did, too. Now, because of what happened to the Betts family, this musician definitely doesn't want the ball out of his sight. And he wants to have it studied, but they have to do it under very controlled circumstances where he's not going to lose possession. Understood. I would love to know who that is and, and find out more about this. Well, I mean, Ross Coulthard has been working with Gary Nolan on this, okay. and I'm not sure where they're at yet in their studies. Part of the issue is it's really expensive to study these things. 
you know, we're talking twenty, thirty thousand dollars to run some of these spectral scans. If you think about a spear flying through the air, I mean, it has no. It's a sphere. It's an orb. I mean, it's round. It has no discernible form of, of lift. Like, how does that yeah. work? Well, if it's, let's say it's employing element 115, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what shape your vehicle is. True. You can have triangles. You can have kerosene tanks, orbs, whatever. Because you are creating your own gravity and you're deciding where gravity is and how much gravity is there, you decide where you go. Was it Graves he, who said that he was encountering, well, these are a different type of sphere. These spheres had a cube in them. Was it Ryan Graves who said he was encountering those things daily on the East Coast? Yes, yes. off of Oceana on the, on the East Coast. The one thing I really wanted to include this in the book, and I and I I came across an article where a cube within a sphere was witnessed, I want to say right around world towards the end of World War II. So even back then, these spheres were in the skies. So I I I found that article somewhere, and then when I went back to grab it up again for the book, I couldn't find it again, so I didn't put it in the book, and I'm still on the lookout for that. But yeah, if anyone out there is aware of that particular article, that really cements the case about these things. These are not Russians or Chinese or whatever. These things have been flying around all this time, and their form is still consistent. Weren't the original Foo Fighters that the band took the name from, weren't they spheres of, of light or something in World War II? Weren't yeah, they the, orbs I, I of believe, some sort? Yeah, those were the, the Foo Fighters were just those orbs of light. That That's part of, again, I, if I could talk to Bob, I would like to know when you see this, the sport model flying during the daytime, it looks like a flying saucer. When you see it flying at night, it's a big glowing object in the sky. Why is that? That's a great question. Because you would think that it would exhibit the same properties, whether it's day or night. So you would think it would glow during the day as well. Yeah. Right. And at the same time, because you can alter the curvature of space time around your vehicle, you can determine whether or not it's visible or not. Right. Well, when we talk about the, the five observables and the transmedium aspect of this, for people who may not be aware of this. I'm get. I'm guessing most people watching this show will be. But transmedia means that you can go through the air, you can go through water, you can go through various forms. And I don't know if I don't remember if someone's already posed this question to you or not. But it, if it's transmedium and it could go through the air, it could go through the water, and it could do the same in the same day. Can it also go through solids? Do you think? That's a good question. I haven't seen that addressed yet. Uh, I've I've heard that question asked and and. The people it was presented to weren't able to give a sufficient enough answer. Well, Salvatore Pi's uh, patent for that craft that you were talking about was a transmedium craft. I believe it could go through the water and go through the air. Is that right? The effect is still the same. So okay. for almost all of these vehicles, you are creating a pocket of subspace around your vehicle. And that's why you can move through space through the air, you can slip into the water and not create a splash. Because you're just basically sliding through reality. So just like the torpedo flying underwater creates a, a vacuum air pocket around it, and that allows it to move at hypersonic speeds underwater, your vehicle can create a pocket of space time around it that makes it, that allows it to move within other elements of space time. And people always ask, like, okay, why can we not get a good picture of a UFO? And you address that. Explain that, because it, it part of this is the reason. So, yeah, when if you can control the curvature of space-time around your vehicle, you can modulate the way light interacts with that curvature around your vehicle. So just like in Star Trek with the cloaking device, mm -hmm. you can alter the modulation, the intensity of that curvature. And what will happen is, as light comes from behind your vehicle, it will arc around the vehicle and then come forward into your eye, and you don't see what's in between. You're just looking at the sky behind it. 
just like the, the new images that show black holes, now we understand black holes and, and the way they actually look like is a big sphere of light around the black hole. Well, the re that, that big arc over the top and the big arc of light over the under the bottom of the black hole is actually the same disk that is orbiting the black hole, but you're seeing the backside of it coming underneath and over. So that's because of the curvature of space-time that creates that effect. So with that being able to modulate it, you could be able to make it invisible to any layer within the spectrum, radar, microwave, visible light. And of course, if you want to take a photograph of such a thing, well, the light's being altered. And so therefore it's going to get fuzzier and fuzzier depending on how much modulation is being presented. And if we had the ability to do such a thing, then you would think that that would have huge defense department uses and they wouldn't want to let go of that secret, which brings me to last year, Chuck Schumer, uh, there was a bill, you mentioned it in the, in the book, and you'll be able to explain it better than I will, because I can't remember exactly how it went down. I think a couple of senators on the East Coast ended up blocking the bill. Yeah, the, the Congress was trying to pass within the budget bill for defense spending. Basically, if you've got non-human, non-human intelligence recovered vehicles, they would make it public or they would make it eminent domain where basically the government would swoop back in and take ownership of whatever you've recovered. So the theory is, is that the government recovers these vehicles and then for $1, we sell it to one of these industrial military contractors. Yeah. And therefore we are no longer in our possession. It's now their property and they're responsible for it. And the government can say, well, we don't have anything like this. However, if let's say you're McDonnell Douglas and you recovered vehicles on your own without government assistance, what right does the government have to come in and scoop it up from you? So even if they had passed that law, which they didn't, right. they would still be able to avoid some of those aspects. And I never understood because I was talking to friends at the time and some people were of the belief, well, maybe maybe these these defense contractors would want to get it off their plate, but I don't really see that as being reasonable. I would think, regardless of if it was given to you by the government or you came upon it through your own research, I just don't see that being the kind of thing that you're going to give back or own up to. I, I find that hard to believe. So um, McDonnell Douglas actually, in the lead up to that bill, was a rumor is was scrambling to try and sell off what they had in their possession because it opened up a whole legal can of worms with their shareholders. If they had been keeping this technology secret from their shareholders, they had grossly violated their responsibilities to shareholders and they could have been sued into oblivion. I do remember that now. I but I think my... they're all breathing a sigh of relief now because it didn't go through. I mean, right. what the, what is, but what's fascinating is of course, there is language now in the Department of Defense about non-human intelligence and all these technologies. I also learned along the way with doing my research that even Richard Nixon had drafted up a, a treaty with Russia, which included the terminology of unidentified flying objects in relations to nuclear defense. So even back in Nixon's time, they made an agreement with Russia that we're going to communicate with each other in case these other third party entities come in. We want to know that we aren't the ones that trigger World War III. And when we see this happening, that that's what it is. And we're in agreement on it. So this phenomenon has definitely been around for a while and the, and the government's aware of it. Agreed. And last summer, was it last summer when David Grush came forth and all this stuff happened really quickly? I was very excited. Part of me was like, okay, what's the catch here? But I believe that David Grush is telling the truth as he knows it. Mm -hmm. And we had and we had those hearings, and Fravor was there, and Ryan Graves was there. All of these men, I believe them. And now it's kind of ground to a halt. Do you have any feeling towards what might be happening next? Well, I'm not sure if you saw the, I want to say his name is Professor Holland, his video that just came out last week. 
rumor is is that potentially SETI in the EU on a completely different tangent, SETI in the EU may have detected technological signatures back in the 90s using the SETI screensaver application. So it's another wow signal or what? Essentially, yeah. The interesting scientific aspect of it that uh, the professor put forward, and professor's his video name, they use a Doppler shift to detect so how do you distinguish a signal that's coming from space from, from simple noise? Because there's all kinds of cosmic radiation and things pouring over the Earth all the time. And the way that they determined that a signal was legitimate signal was its Doppler shift. Mm -hmm. Now, your first instinct might be, well, even pulsars, the type of stars, have a Doppler shift. All stars have a Doppler shift. What was interesting was they were focusing their uh, radio telescopes towards planets orbiting stars, okay? And not only were the, the Doppler shifts just showing the distance to that star, but the Doppler shifts can also have an orbital pattern so that as the signal comes and orbits the planet and points towards us it has a shift in one direction and then as it moves away it has a shift in a different direction that's how you can distinguish a signal is in an orbiting position okay and then on top of that the signal had a particular modulation to that signal that said it was something of a technological nature now according to the eu in italy they believe that technological signature actually represents an image uh, but uh, they haven't been able to decode it yet which i don't find unsurprising right uh, but theoretically they've picked up about 18 of these signatures in their research from the 90s and they're still working to verify them so maybe some of the reason is there's this race to determine who can uh make that revelation first it would because this is far more fascinating than simply looking at the atmosphere of a planet through the jwst and determining there's organic molecules or not in the atmosphere that's actually they're deeply debating whether or not you can even determine if life is available through that method but if you can pick up a technological signal and my thought is why aren't we using ai for pattern recognition in an attempt to decode these signals. So that, that there's, is, there's lots of fascinating things in, in motion. So, well, that's another interesting thing about the timing of this three body problem television show. I watch these things. And I always wonder, you know, what, what is the meaning of this? Is it strictly fiction? Because we talk we're, in that movie where they're talking about solar effects were coming up on this, on this, eclipse that everybody's worked up about they talk about the wow signal in that movie and now this yeah. is happening but one last thing that i want to ask you about you you touch upon this and towards the end of the book as well and i believe the cia the ex-cia guy is named ramirez don ramirez yes yeah. so i heard him a year or two ago talking about this idea that we were on this 10-year 10-year plan, essentially, and that in 2027, somehow, in some way, this information or they are going to show up or whatever. Talk, talk about that a little bit. So retired high-ranking uh, individual from the CAA, John Ramirez, he was, um, I can't remember his exact rank, but he was definitely like up there in the ranks. Fascinating part about this gentleman was he was privy to a lot of technology a lot of technology used by the CIA. And he was even offered to be read into some of the legacy program with the UFOs, but he he opted out. He refrained from signing any non-disclosure agreements involving UFOs because he found the subject completely fascinating and often attended MUFON conventions as a CIA operative. He disclosed everything to his superiors and he can actually speak out on the subject today because he did not sign those non-disclosure agreements. So over the course of his long career within the CIA, 30 plus years, 
you pick up things along the way in the background or in secured compartmented facilities skiffs. And he came to understand that 2017, when the New York Times article came out, was basically a launching point and a countdown that uh, his understanding is within 10 years of that date that something is supposed to occur, an event might happen in 2027. And that if if we just, if the CIA and the, and the government just sits on their hands and do nothing, then they're gonna be in deep trouble if they don't try and bring the rest of society up to speed is their understanding. And this was something that was known and spoken about in very classified settings. I'll be honest, when I, I heard that guy for the first time a couple of years ago, I was like, I don't know. But I have reconsidered that. And I, I, I didn't know at the time when I heard him, because I've heard so many things over the years from, from so many. And part of me, well, a lot of me has always wanted disclosure. And I do think disclosure is inevitable. How it comes about, I'm not really sure. But when I heard this guy initially, I was like, well, I'm going to I'm going to wait and see what that is. But I've since heard in other areas similar things. And if it is 2027, I mean, that's not very long. That's right. We, we are coming up on that, which makes me think going back to David Grush and the things that happened last year. It seems like that's all kind of on pause right now, especially with Arrow coming out with this really dismissive little report they just put out. That makes me think that in some way, things must be about to kick back up if this is going to happen in 2027 in whatever fashion it takes. Well, of course, we're all aware of the other 40 firsthand whistleblowers waiting in the wings. Yeah. You know, maybe all of these elements are being lined up. Um, Eric W. Davis, if you're out there, we really appreciate you coming forward and, and sure. in your bravery in doing so. <laughs> yes. Gary, thank you so much for being on board with us today. I'm going to put all the links to your websites and to the book. And I got to say, man, I think your book is really refreshing. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it would be a good primer to give if you're listening to this show because you're interested in the UAP UFO question and you want a book to show to your friends that are not buying it. I think this is a good one. Yeah. If you're struggling to understand all of these heady concepts the, the great part about the book is you can sit down and you can take your time and digest it with the images and what have you. And it's the first in a series. I'm continuing on with a second book right now, actually doing a lot of research on crop circles, actually. I like that. It is funny. I've heard you say that in a couple of interviews and, and it made me think I'm like, like any great fantasy writer or 1970s prog rock band, my man is doing a trilogy. <laughs> I like that. So Gary, thank you so much for your time today. And any last words for the audience? I just had a great time and I love talking about this subject. It's quite fascinating. I think it is too. And my whole life I've wondered about this and it is along with consciousness, which I think is your third, going to be your third book. These are the big questions. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoy this content and you enjoy the conversations that we're having here on Michael Parker Media, I would ask you, please hit the like button, hit subscribe. I'm on every platform that's out there and I could use your help. This programming is free. And if you would do that for me, I would appreciate it a lot. And go buy Gary's book. It is UFO Science, Secret New Physics, Vehicles, and UAP. Ladies and gentlemen, until next time, keep your heart and your mind open. <laughs>